I can't hear you. Who do you want to hear, Burgess? Is uh, Natalie speaking to oh. us? Uh, Edel, Edel, Natalie, please unmute when you're ready. You're still not unmuted, Natalie. Please unmute. Perfect. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our winter quarter session for WCCC New York. We are a very vigorous and dynamic chapter of the North American segment of WCCC of Commerce. Today, we have a fabulous sessions arranged for you, and uh, we will have a presentation and questions and answers right now. I'm going to turn over the meeting to our President Emeritus of WZCC, uh, Adel Dauber, and he is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Good day, everyone, and thank you, India, for staying up late. Today's talk is by Burgess Dadi Surti from Nairobi, Kenya. And we have the New York chapter folks at the Daramir watching on two large screens and others on Zoom from around the globe. This appears to be the new normal. Burgess is going to talk about his inspirational entrepreneurial journey. He had a comfortable job with Thermax and something triggered a desire for him to become an entrepreneur. He started with boilers, but soon it expanded into water treatment, industrial chemicals, and solar power, and he was offering employment to 600 people. Fifteen years ago, he saw an opportunity and jumped into rose farming, growing roses and distributing it around the world. Today, it is the 10th largest rose farm in the world, with 2,500 employees, yes, 2,500, exporting 400,000 rose stems every day. By the way, I've already been asked to place an order from Zagni for 200 rose stems for Mukhtar every year. <laughs> Burgess wants to focus his talk on the four pillars of entrepreneurship, which he has identified from his experience, namely interdependence, win-win, faith, and most importantly, adversity coefficient. Now a little about Burgess. He comes from a middle-class family, grew up in a middle-class family in Calcutta in Jamshedpur. He had the reputation of being both the smartest and the naughtiest in his class. He graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering and post-graduation management. He started with Thermax Limited and became its star salesperson by the age of 31 and recognized as the ideal manager for a posting in Nairobi, Kenya. Within two years at age 35, his entrepreneurial juices started flowing and he took the entrepreneurial leap. He's an extremely well-respected entrepreneur in East Africa and Spentomatic Group was recognized as one of the best companies to work for. He's a voracious reader and well-versed in philosophy. He's a mentor to many and always humble about his achievements. His wife, Anu, is an entrepreneur in her own right, running a scientific detox center and a tour and travel agency. His daughter, Nakita, and son, Trishad, are now involved in the business. Entrepreneurship must be in the family because his nephew is our own Jehan Kotwa, who is also doing great stuff and who calls Burgess the best mama anyone could ever have. So with that, over to you, Burgess. Thank you, Edel. Thank you, Natalie. Can everyone hear me clearly? You're clear, Burgess, yeah. fine. Okay. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to sincerely thank WZCC New York chapter for giving me this opportunity. I, I truly feel deeply humbled uh, to go through my life journey and give my ideas. And I really do hope that at the end of this, if anybody even gains slightly, I would be most delighted. 
So Idl has spoken quite a bit about my early life, etc. But I thought, but I've actually got a presentation in place, so I'll go through it with you. So this is my, this was my uh, family when I was a little boy, my mom, dad, and uh, my younger sister, Sanoba, and that's me there. And uh, my mom was a housewife later on in her life, but uh, in her early life, she worked for the Tata Sons in Bombay House. She was a postgraduate post -graduate in economics and uh, quite a knowledgeable lady. My dad was a automobile engineer and uh, uh, a person who, who just loved his cars and loved his automobiles. And we were an upper middle class, I would say, family. And uh, most importantly, the value systems that come in many Parsi families uh, were imbibed into us from childhood. Value systems of uh, being honest, of integrity, of uh, working towards uh, purpose, ensuring that people who are underprivileged are, are taken care of. So all these value systems were there in our household and we were an extremely happy family. And uh, I, 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 I can't remember a period of my early childhood that I regret or have, you know, stormy ideas about. There was no shortage of anything and uh, but there was no opulence either. And uh, because we were all so happy and everything was fun and uh, there, was, there was reasonable, plentiful everywhere, uh, that it also helped me shape my outlook. I had a positive outlook to life. And when I look back, I feel confident that that outlook came from my childhood, where Eventually, even if things went wrong, uh, I would be positive about things and try and overcome them. My, my mother was absolutely insistent that I go to the best schools that exist in the city that we are. And in Calcutta, we had two really very good schools, La Martinier, which was a French chain for boys, and uh, there's also St. Xavier's. And uh, La Martinia was quite an expensive school. And she believed that education was the great differentiator. So it was not easy to get admission into the school either. But I think I made the cut. And then that was really a good thing because the school really forged my thinking. And along with that, my mother she gave me the fortitude to think independently. Very often any household problem, issue, discussion, or any discussion would happen and my mother would ask me, what is your thought process? What is your independent opinion? And uh, I would give it. And sometimes if I was told you try this, and if I would fail, I would never be chastised for failure. And it, this made me not to be afraid of failure. My father worked really hard. And uh, though India of that time, that is about 50 years back, 45 years, 50 years back, was not an India of plentiful. So he had to put in a lot of hard work. And uh, that was a work ethic that I saw. And I saw that, that there is no substitute for this hard work. And many times as parents, we think that we are teaching our children things by telling them things. But in reality, children learn much more by seeing how their parents behave or what they do or what they, how, how they live. And I saw my father putting in huge, huge amounts of effort to see that we had a good life. 
So this is something I want to say that whether it's entrepreneurship, a job, company, corporate life, hard work is a given. Let's 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 not even discuss this. That uh, what happens with hard work? Uh, you know whether we can work smart. This that. Yes, we work smart, but hard work is a given. So then from Calcutta, we got transferred to Tata Nagar. My father was in a transferable job. And uh, I was exposed to the Tatas. The Tatas were actually omnipresent. They were in everything. They were everywhere. And uh, people loved the Tatas. Till date, as we... I was there even in December, nothing has changed. Nobody has one single word to say, you know, which is not good about the Tatas. All of them have only got praises and praises. And in people's houses, in those days, we used to see Jamshedji Nasarwanji Tata's photograph hung on the wall in everybody's house, whether they worked for the Tatas or they didn't. And this was... This was phenomenal. This kind of reveration was, was, was phenomenal. Then as, as I grew over there and I was trying to understand what is it that they do that makes them so different? So one thing which, of course, in later times when I started reading about the Tatas, I realized that as entrepreneurs, their objective was not to create wealth. Their objective was nation building. If they could add value back to the nation that they belong to. So everything was about India, about how they could build India. The second thing was, how can they give back to their employees? And they truly do, because in, in Jamshedpur, you have the best hospitals. You have the best child care centers. You have the, the way the Tata's take care of their employees, somebody in your, the employee passes away, they will actually take another family member, train him, teach him or her, and bring him up to speed so that they can give him a job so that this family is taken care of. So in this process, they were creating wealth by empowering the people who were working for them. So as their employees grew, as the city grew, as the nation grew, wealth was created, infrastructure was created, and entrepreneurship was there for everyone to see. So here again, like, like I was saying in the family, you see what your mom and dad do. For me, living in Jamshedpur, I saw what the Tatas did. And if you saw or met Jadi Tata or any of these senior top executives at that time. We used to go to the, the clubs, they used to be there. And there was they were just regular people, a lot of humility. They would talk so simply, dress simply. There was no show off. So I think this really helped me understand their ethos. And then in future, when I started becoming an entrepreneur, I started thinking that sometimes you need to follow. You need to follow people. You need to follow prophets. You need to follow somebody who you, you need to have an understanding of things. So the Tatas eventually became a guiding light for me in all my future endeavors. Then as a young adult, I, I did my degree in mechanical engineering. I did my post graduation in in marketing, and uh, and my first job with was with uh, a very big engineering conglomerate in India called Thermax India. Now, Thermax is a fantastic company, fantastic engineering company. At that time, it was growing at a massive pace, and it was very well known for boilers, and. Uh, it was a company which gave a lot of freedom to operate, to, to innovate, to try. And I was delighted to work for it. And uh, for me, it was a life-changing moment when they put me in sales in Calcutta. Because I didn't realize that I had uh, natural sales skills. So I loved every moment. I was, I was like meeting customers, looking at complex technical solutions, 
then customers who are confounded, who are in doubt, I would bring clarity to their minds. And there was freedom in the company to innovate, bring about new solutions, and you would get accolades for it. And finally, in, in, in B2B, what is today called B2B sales, the capital equipment sales, the values are large. The customers are you know, buying very large value, highly technical equipment to run their plants. So when they buy your equipment, there's a deep sense of victory and achievement. And that was that those were highs which were fantastic. So as a young adult, I found that I was adding value to climate change. I was reducing the energy footprint. I was improving customer bottom lines. I was upgrading customers' process technology. I felt I was doing something more than just doing a job. I felt I was adding value back to life in some way. In my own little way, in my mind, I felt I'm doing something. I'm doing something good. In this process, because I was in eastern part of India, the company wanted to move into the tea industry. And uh, they felt that I should be put there. So I was put into the tea industry to learn their manufacturing processes and see how we can transform their energy efficiencies in terms of drying. Because when you make tea, you need to dry the tea. And drying the tea, you need to wither the tea. So all of this requires a huge amount of energy. So I did well there. We started making inroads in the tea industry. So, so in just a few years of working in Calcutta, I was moved to the head office, which is in Pune. And I was asked to launch new, very, very energy efficient dryers along with steam boilers. There were no steam boilers in tea. And the industry was not in a position to accept it because the technology was not clearly understood. So I not only launched steam as a medium of heating to India, I also launched it in Sri Lanka. And uh, that dropped their energy footprint down phenomenally. Also the quality of teas that were being made was superior, the rejects were lesser. So I was delighted that singularly I was doing something where a whole industry was, was seeing a difference and I was spearheading this. At that time, uh, the chairman of the company was Mr. R. D. Aga, Rointan Aga, and uh, he, he then awarded me the most outstanding achiever award of Thermax. It was a single award for one person in the whole company. And uh, it, was, it was a very good feeling because I, I felt delighted that my, my efforts have been recognized. Now come to my midlife. So the company decided when I was 31 years old to transfer me to Kenya as a business head for the East African operations. Thermax decided it. And uh, then a new life journey had begun with my wife, Anu, and uh, my one-year-old year old daughter, Nikita. It, it's, it's easy to say, but it was a new continent, new countries in these continents, new cultures, new rules of engagement. Everything that happened in India in a particular way did not happen here. Malawi worked very differently from Uganda. Uganda worked very differently from Kenya. Uh, and there was really little assistance because our offices here were pretty small. There was very poor infrastructure. Africa had far poorer infrastructure than India also. It was the third world. It is still the third world. And to add to all of this, I must admit that my inexperience, there was no... There was nowhere I could go and, you know, learn about all of this overnight. I couldn't Google anything. So I was swimming in the deep end and there was adversity everywhere. So for people, especially the younger lot, I want to just point out that there was no internet. 
no Wi-Fi, no internet, no mobile phones, and phones that didn't work. So sometimes there was, the fax had just come, but you had to sit next to the fax machine to try and send a fax. And if it went through, you felt you, felt you had achieved something. So now when you are faced with so much of adversity, it's like, how do you, how do you run a company? How do you do business? You just, you're stranded on every front. Then came the Manford program. Thermax held the program in Bombay. They asked this company, which has the Manford program, which is based on Professor John Nash. I'm sure many of you all have seen A Beautiful Mind. He was, uh, he, he was uh, schizophrenic, and, uh, but he developed the game theory. And it's a mathematical program which, uh, which works on the thought process of win-win. So he proves how, how, how you can only win if you play win-win. So the story goes like this, that they, they, they had this program and in the program they had various small groups and, and they were all groups where each was a company and there was a common goal to be achieved. And most of the teams that were playing were traditionally playing a win-lose game. And I, by chance, was heading my team and I insisted that this is not the way to go. So it went on on up to a point where I got into a strong, strong confrontation with the coordinator or the moderator and, and eventually brought that whole program to a standstill. Then this was in a five-star hotel in Bombay. Then the, our vice president called me from Pune and he's a Gujarati guy. He called me, he said, Baba. To su karech, to akku program aj roka vidi do yar, chalwa deni. Then I said, okay. So I, I kept telling the moderator, this is all wrong. These are wrong theories you are teaching us. This is not correct. And I stood my ground. Anyway, on the last day, so the, so the basis of this program was that they would just let people move along using a win-lose, win-lose way of working and then show them how Professor John Nash had shown that this win-lose will never reach a, a destination of winning. So how one has to play this game win-win. So on the last day, they slowly started accepting what I was saying for all these days. And one by one, one by one, by the time the program ended, it was like, I whatever I was saying, so the moderator said, you were messing up my program. You were coming to the, you know, the la it was like watching a movie whose last few, uh, you know, shots are being informed. You know, you tell somebody the end of the story and then there's no fun seeing the movie. So that's why they were fighting me so much. But to me, it was a validation of my thought processes. I realized that I was thinking right. I was thinking win-win at the core of my being. And that was something I was very, very happy about because this to me was, was, was important that yes, my thought processes are correct. At the end of this, at the end of this program, I asked for, a, you know, reports that were submitted to the top management about who should do what. And the report on me came that you, he is very fit for entrepreneurship. So if Thermax wants to open up other companies somewhere, then he can be uh, one to start them, set them up, incubate them, and then move on to others. So here I'd like to tell people that in, in, in entrepreneurship, the model is the people you work with, which is your team of life. It comprises of your colleagues, 
your subordinates, your suppliers, your customers, your banks, your financiers, friends, family. We are all interdependent on each other. There is no real thing as, oh, he's so independent. Oh, he's so isolated. Yes, maybe in a particular kind of job where you're a research scientist, maybe just doing things independently is okay. Or in some other jobs, you know, you have too much dependence. But in reality, to play win-win, you need to be interdependent on everyone. And others are interdependent on you. And when you understand this and you treat people equally and you let them know that, yes, I am dependent on you. And, uh, and it, you can also be dependent on me. Then, then there is success. So you make people feel all of the above, that you are as good as they are. And without them, there is no success. So everyone must win. Sometimes in the short run, you may feel the pressure. You might feel as if you're losing and somebody else is winning more. But if you stick to the, the path, in the, long, in the long haul, in the long road, you will find that you will be winning and, and you will be amazed at the results that are coming your way. So win-win is the mantra. So by 33, I wanted to shift and become an entrepreneur. This sounds really, really fancy. You know, one fine day, you, you have a wife, you have a kid, you have a job, everything is doing well, and uh, you want to be an entrepreneur. So this but, but, but means your regular salary will stop. All your perks will stop. Your savings will erode like a rocket ship. They will move out of your pocket so fast. And then what if you fail? This thought, what if you fail? This nagging doubt that is deep inside of you. What if whatever money I have saved, everything gets eroded and I've tried this fancy thing called entrepreneurship and I fail. So believe me, this fear of failure is real. I've met many, many, many big industrialists because of the kind of work I do. And I have yet to meet one who says that he doesn't feel the fear. Every one of us feels it. Okay. Now, I'd like to say one thing that you're not alone. So who is next to you? You have your wife. I had my wife, Anu, who never had any doubt. And she had a lot of faith, deep and resolute faith in the Almighty. She felt strongly that if you try, you're not going to fail. And she stuk, stood by me like the Rock of Gibraltar. And she was there and was ready to walk step in step, which is very important, not behind me, not ahead of me but step in step and saying, let's do this together. You want to become an entrepreneur. This is an opportunity. You understand this. Why are you so scared of failure? We will forego some of our, you know, so-called trappings and we will make do with what we have to see that a final goal is reached. And as a result, we never looked back. So this is my wife, Anu. And, uh, She's a, a successful entrepreneur, besides being my great support system. She has two, two businesses, a scientific detox center. She pioneered this whole concept of detox in East Africa. And she also has a tour and travel agency for inbound tourism, for safaris, etc. And the rest of my family, who are equally part of my support system, the, my daughter is older, Nikita. She has joined us in our solar business. Uh, and uh, she, she, she also wanted to be an entrepreneur. So within our businesses, I said that, why don't you 
try intrapreneurship by which you start a small entity of your own. We will assist you. We will give you the wherewithal, but you need to run it yourself. And we let the levels of difficulty be as much as possible. And if you really struggle, we'll come in. So she started work on, a, on the home solar business over here. And uh, her company is now beginning to take shape. And our main big solar company is assisting her, was assisting her in the beginning. But now slowly she is on her own. My son is an engineer, Trishad. And uh, he is a very, very, uh, how do I put it? He loves his engineering. So that is, and he's a mechanical engineer. So he's been looking at getting new technologies, new systems into our company that will have a marketplace in Africa, which can actually build Africa, empower Africa. And uh, he has found a few things which are making things really better for our customers. He's still young, he's 25. So both of them are, are part and parcel of our family entrepreneurship. So one of the questions Edel was asking was, how did you set up Spanomatic Kenya? The backstory is that, and I'll say this in brief, that Thamax, after Mr. Aga passed away, Thamax decided to shut down its international offices and uh, set up agents, agency agreements. So one company was, was actually found by me and they became the agent for, for Thermax. But I think they'd never realized that this is actually high-end engineering and quite tough. So I was asked to assist them. After some time, they, they realized that, that it was it was not going to be up there alley to run this kind of stuff. And I was wanting to go ahead myself. So all these things put together, we started with some sweat equity for myself. And I moved from Thermax to Spinomatic. And uh, slowly and steadily, I bought out the rest of the shareholders. And now this became our first company, which in the last 25 years, we have grown it into a group of companies, we rebranded, that was our original logo. This is our new rebranded logo. So we have four companies, mainly in boilers, in water treatment, solar power plants and industrial chemicals. We now have a staff of about, about 600 people. And I feel very, very satisfied that we are able to employ so many people and the Employment part is like this, that with each employment, each household is finding a way to educate their children, to break that glass ceiling. And so many of our staff, our children are now, some of them have got jobs and uh, their families are able to sustain, survive for themselves. You enable, you empower their lives. And this has been a, a great sense of, satisfaction for me. Uh, it's not about how much wealth one created for oneself alone, because you can only drive one car at a time and you know sleep in one bed at a time. But when you really add value to the country, to the people, it, it gives you a deep sense of satisfaction that can't be bought. Then we have got many, many awards over time. In our solar companies, we've been awarded the best solar company in East Africa. We've been in the top 100 companies given by KPMG, et cetera, et cetera. But the one award that I have over the years really felt very delighted about was when in 2016, Deloitte did a confidential survey of, of, of all the employees of our company. Each and every one was given a confidential document without name. And we really came in fifth behind world majors like DHL, Diageo, AIG Insurance. These were the three, four companies that were ahead of us. And I was quite delighted that it was, it was again a validation of the leadership. It was a validation of my thought processes. 
of what I thought was right. And so that people who worked here were feeling happy to work here. And, and what, what better joy can it give an entrepreneur when he finds that the teams he's working with are delighted to work with him? So I have been reflecting on this, that it is my heritage. It is my value systems of being a Parsi. And I'm proud of that. What my parents taught me, how my, my family stood by me, my wife, kids, and how much I've learned by watching the Tata's ideals, as I said, growing up earlier, that we have companies that have people who feel so pleased to work with us. And uh, I thought I'd talk about this because this is important that you, you have organizations where the people who work in the organization want to work there. Then about 15 years back, I got into, uh, I decided to diversify and I got into rose farming. This is a rose farm. It's a drone view of uh, one of our farms. So we have four such rose farms. We have two potato farms. And uh, as Adel said, we are the 10th largest rose growing company in the world with 2,500 employees exporting about 400,000 rose stems every day. These are greenhouses that you see. And uh, this is Kenya. So we also do potatoes on a large scale. And in the future, we will be growing, moving into growing avocados for export. It's, it's uh, Kenya grows, grows some of the best avocados like Mexico. So that's another, agriculture is an exciting area. It, uh, it's rewarding, it's, it's, it's not easy, it seems easy, but it's not easy, but it's, it's a lot of, it's, a, it's also a lot of satisfaction. We will also be setting a plant for extracting avocado oil, and we'll do both, export avocados as a whole, and also oil. So to sum this up, before we go to some of the, my learnings, is I, I have this always in my mind, this poem by Robert Frost. I'm sure all of you have heard it, but this is a paragraph which has touched my heart always. And I think I'll play it here now so that you know where my mindset lies. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. So I was asked that in your entrepreneurial journey, what were the few pillars that you think were really there for you? And what, what was it? So we talked about win-win. We talked about interdependence. Now I'll talk about faith. This I have thoughtfully put as what I did and what he did. And the, it's important that each one understands that the I did is as important as the he did. Because... In my early 20s, I was really trying to figure out how to lead my life. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? What will I do? Am I just one more person just leading a life? So I, I, I got involved in reading various religious books of various denominations and uh, some non-religious philosophies also. I was reading, I could have read lots of the Bible, a good amount of the Quran. Uh, uh, reading the Avastha was not easy. Trying to figure it out, not easy. But you kept reading, 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 and uh, even reading Baha'i. A lot of things by Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Baha. 
and trying to understand what they are saying. Then non-religious philosophies like individualism by Ayn Rand or Khalil Gibran, who is my who was my guiding light for the longest time, and even Richard Bach. At one stage, I was even fascinated enough to read Mein Kampf, the life, life story of Adolf Hitler. So I was reading. I was reading, trying to figure out. But I found that day to day, how do you lead your life? It is so difficult to lead your life. So if, you're, if, you, read the, if you read the Gita, and if you follow, say, the Hare Krishna denomination, and they are chanting, they are saying, stay away, then how do you work? How do you have a career? How do you have a business, etc.? And yet, you say, you give up everything. Buddhism says, give up everything. Jainism says, give up everything. That's when I realized that Zarathustra's teaching were very, very easy, yet very powerful, and they were possible to live by. So he, we are, we, all Zarathusis here will know humata, hukta, huvarsta, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. But these are not just words. If you want to follow this unfailingly on a daily basis, it's not easy, especially the area of good deeds is not easy at all. And you have to really try every day to look when opportunities come to you that you have to do some good. You have to keep adding value back to life. That's why I wrote what I did, what he did. So when my mind, so this is the part where what I did, I followed the philosophy. I kept my mind clear. I would ensure whatever I spoke was of high integrity, was helpful to somebody else. And my deeds were always, always on spot that this is the word of God. This is how I spread the gospel, by my deeds, not by propagating the gospel. And whenever my mind would stray, I would think of what all of us know, Vaumana, the good mind. This is not easy. Sometimes you get angry and uh, sometimes you, you, you really think wrong things, but it takes time to think back, take a little while and say, let the good mind prevail. Let the correct thinking prevail. And so this is how I would find to do some good every day of my life and not wait till I was retired. And whenever I would reach a dead end on many things and many times, and I still do, I would just not know how to solve this. The only way I would do it, I would pray hard. I had seen my wife doing it all the time. And so I would ask for divine intervention and support. And the strangest part, the most miraculous thing, that there has never been a day or time when divine intervention has not come. It has come in a way which... I did not imagine, I did not think, I would not even have an iota of understanding that it would come that way. But it did. It has always. And it will come. Because all of us, all of us are the children of God. So if it happens for me, it will happen for you. I am sure of this. This, this faith is unshakable. And lastly, this is a little bit of a funny incident. When I was growing up, all the people in India where I grew up would talk about his IQ. He has a high IQ. He has a very high IQ. IQ, IQ, IQ. IQ was all, all prevalent. Later on in life, now, I would say it's highly overrated. Uh, some years back, I had read Jyadi Tata's one quote saying that I would have... I would rather have a committed person working with Tata's rather than a very highly intelligent one. I had really thought about that statement. And now I understand why he said that. Hi IQ is good. In some places, the IQ is required in some development research areas. But in day-to-day -day life, 
a reasonable amount of IQ is, is good enough. Then some time later, we started hearing about EQ, emotional quotient. How are you emotionally with people? How do you transact? And, and truly enough, somebody said, you know, when you meet him, you get the right vibe. What is that vibe? That vibe was the emotional quotient of a person, person how good it was. And it is very important. And uh, if you have high IQ, low EQ, you cannot transact with people. You just sit in front of a computer probably and just carry on because you're not able to transact with people. Then much later, I learned of SQ. And I'm sure all of you have heard of it, the spiritual quotient, saying that how much spirituality do you have in you? When people meet you, do they feel a sense of happiness? Do they feel this person is honest? This person is sincere? And it comes from your inner spirituality, which you don't talk about, but people feel it when they meet you. So there was a time I would constantly reflect on my successes and failures. And believe me, there were lots and lots of failures. So I would think... I would think, what are the reasons we are succeeding as a company, as a person, as an organization, organizations? And in this, I would think that we failed, but we eventually succeeded. So we succeeded, but we failed, but we eventually succeeded. So one day, just by chance, I told myself that all these quotients, I'm sure there must be an adversity quotient. And by chance, I googled it. And it really was there. There was something called the adversity quotient. I was shocked that I didn't know it. I stumbled upon it, actually. It's defined as it's a person who can effectively face obstacles, convert challenges to opportunities. I would say very simply, it's a person who, when he falls, has the propensity, the capability to get up and run again, to get up and run again, to get up and run again. That is the adversity quotient because adversity is not going to go away. If your companies are small, there's adversity of smallness. When your companies become big, there's the adversity of largeness. When you have more profits, then you have to tax plan. When you have lesser profits, you have to plan, plan your cash flows. When you have COVID, you have to run your businesses, you have to pay your salaries, but COVID exists. So adversities are not going away. New adversities are always going to be coming. And so this is also called the science of resilience. So finally, if I have to sum up, I've said a lot, but if you want to take my take as an entrepreneur, and if any one of you wants to go in for entrepreneurship, Check your AQ because AQ is king. Adversity quotient is king. With that, I'd like to end my, my ideas and thoughts. And uh, after this, I'm happy to take any questions or anything that you all have to say. Thank you. What do you wish? Thank you, thank you tremendously for a most inspiring presentation. We have people uh, across the globe telling us that they have been very inspired by what you've said today and by explaining your entrepreneurial journey to us. Now, our floor is open for Q&A. We'd like to take uh, questions from our audience here in New York. We have uh, people in person so this is a good chance for you to, uh, to give us your questions. And we have people on our, uh, on our uh, global web, uh, web <laughs> chat, and they have questions too. So um, let us see. Yes, okay, well, let's take one from, we have Don uh, online who has asked uh, about uh, citizenship. Uh, have you, kept Indian citizenship or have you transferred over to Kenya and how has that affected you? Are there uh, obstacles for you there? Uh, if you 
if you have remained uh, with the Indian citizenship. So if that's not too personal, maybe maybe we could explore that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kenyan citizenship is is available to Indians, but it is not easy to get. And uh, in in my in my case, uh, I I did opt for going in for Kenyan citizenship because when you when you have so many businesses and people, etc., uh, and and there is so much land, we have one thousand two hundred and fifty acres of land we own on which we grow all these things. So unless you are a citizen, your rights are 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 lesser. And secondly, it 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 empowers you when you're a citizen. But for me, it was a little easier. I I. I had put up my application for citizenship and in which I actually explained as to how much we, we had put up a lot of biomass boilers against oil fired boilers. And it had completely transformed the import bill of the country because of the work our company had done. So, you know, these are import dependent countries where oil was being imported to run the boilers for industries. And by selling biomass fired equipment and putting them across industry, millions of tons of oil and that by that token, billions of US dollar worth of import bill was reduced. So when I explained this in my application, I was granted Kenyan citizenship with immediately. So I did take Kenyan citizenship. I see, very interesting. Okay, we have another question in the chat uh, that's asking about how you manage work-life balance with running, running all of the companies and working so hard and being so uh, responsible for thousands of employees. Uh, how do you have time and private time for your family and yourself? How do you do that? So, so one, one, one honest, thing here is that like India, we do have a much more amount of assistance and help in terms of domestic help, drivers, gardeners, assistants, etc. So a lot of a lot of the tasks are easily done and taken care of, unlike in the Western world where you end up doing a lot of stuff yourself. More often than not. Secondly, the weather here is is phenomenal for for 11 months in the year it is about 21 degrees centigrade 21 22 so so there's no inclement weather to go against you all right so one is you have a lot of help two the weather is very good and thirdly it's your mindset when my daughter nikita was very young one day i came home she must have been 2 3 years old and uh, and I came home and she walked past me without hugging me or wishing me. So I went in and I told Anu, I said, what's going on? Why has Nikita just walked past me? And she, you know, I, I complained to her. So she said, you know, when you get up so early in the morning, by the time you're gone, she's still sleeping. By the time you come back, it's her time to sleep. You hardly meet her on Sundays. And that also you have something or the other lined up. So what else do you expect? She's, she, she thinks it's okay not to be with you. This hit me very hard. And uh, I decided that it will not be like this. So then I, I would come home at 6.30. I'd be with the kids, spend time with them. And if I had to do my work, I do it late night or early morning, but I spend time. Then I, I did not join some many clubs or, you know, various, you know, institutions because I was traveling a lot. All my, all my time would have, my family would have it. I was not having, you know, you know, men's clubs and this and that, none of that. So I started spending and I made it a point that whatever be the work, however important it is, I would always be available for my kids. So 
for their school functions, for their for any any school function. I never missed a single function. I never missed a doctor's appointment. I would just not do it. I mean, both of us, Anu and me, would be together in it, but I would definitely be there unless I was traveling. It was the same with my parents. My parents lived in India and I would drop what I was doing. If they were unwell, I would be there with them till they got well and come back. So I had decided that my family will come first and these businesses will come second. This was a, a mental thing in my head. Once that was set, it was not difficult. And Very good. Yeah. all I thought was that it will slow down the pace of growth or it'll slow down things, but it was not at their cost. Right. And, 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 and my kids recognize that today, saying that you were always there. Very good. You set priorities. We have a question from the audience. Hello. Um, thank you very much for your speech. I mean, your presentation it was remarkable. The remarkable career and everything. Um, I just have a question actually regarding because you mentioned earlier that B two B and um, you know, recently the phrase is really has changed to B two B to S, which is stands for society. So I want to ask you, I know that in Africa, basically, you have employed a lot of people and that's, that's tremendous and I'm sure that has a big impact on the community there. But what specific uh, impact your businesses have on the society and the community at large in Africa, if you could elaborate a little bit. Thank you. Natalie, I could not get her question. There was a bit of a hum. Can you just briefly tell me what she was asking? Okay, let me try to summarize. Uh, the question was, with all of the impact you've had so tremendously for so many people in Africa, for all of your employees and so forth, uh, the questioner was uh, wondering about the larger impact on the culture per se in Kenya. Uh, being a major employer and running such significant businesses in, in that uh, country, you have to have a wider impact. And if you could explain a little bit of what you think your, your uh, impact has been on the culture or <coughs> environment in Kenya. That's what you're asking. So, the society in general. For, so the, firstly, they have, uh, they have a lot of, uh, in India, we call it uh, caste and community. Here they call it tribes. Okay. So we made it a point to see that we always employed people from all tribes so that it became a melting pot and not just one tribe. And that has created a lot of communal harmony. We have various... CSR programs like on our farms, we have programs for distributing trees to everyone. We have programs for clinics for our people there. And then the other thing is gender equality. This is something that is very strong in my mind. After I'd seen my mother and father, there was gender equality there. And uh, so in, in every job, anything that we take somebody, there is no gender bias at all. And whenever, one of the things I learned in Thermax was that when people are not doing well and they are, they are struggling, you don't take the first step of firing them. So we always try to put them through some training. Some, so you, so the HR then puts them through a training module uh, even if they have to go for a course, so you upgrade or you you change. So what is happening is there was a lot of fear. In so to answer her question, most of the Africans were afraid because when the co the colonial masters used to be there, they were very strict. They would at the first mistake, you'd be you'd be sacked. So there was a lot of fear that if I make a mistake, so there was fear to innovate, fear to talk, fear to come out in the open. So we have created an environment where the employees who work are free to disagree. There is 
freedom of dissonance. I have so many junior employees who can come and tell me, boss, you're completely wrong. I disagree with you. I'll say, okay, tell me. And I'll say, if, if, you, if you are right, I'm delighted. Let's go for it. But you have to walk the talk. So, so many different areas where we have been adding value, which is changing the culture of the people that is there. It, and one more thing, internet is now at the fingertips of the Africans. If all of them have mobile phones. There is mobile money. So they are able to read and inform themselves. So the Africa of 25 years back is not the Africa of today. The average African, the Kenyan, the Ugandan, the Tanzanian, Malawian is an extremely informed person. And I will tell you, I do travel across the world. And unlike what many people in the West feel, many a Westerner, many a person in say America or Canada or England or Germany is far less informed today than many a Kenyan. Far less, not less, far less. That's very fascinating, thank you. Another question we have in our chat is, uh, how do you help people manage risk for themselves and how, uh, in, how do you help investors minimize failure uh, with knowledge-based approaches? Uh, in some cases, do you help guide a person uh, and redirect them uh, by telling them something, an opportunity is not quite right for them. So how do you handle situations like that where there might be too much risk? So I, I would not say I'm risk averse, nor am I uh, overly, overly greatly a risk taker as, as at the helm of things. Okay. But I also believe that unless we try we won't know. So when we take when we take risks that are where we know that this risk was a calculated one, a deliberated one, and it can fail, then that's a cost, that's a sunk cost, we go for it. But the general risks that are there, there is risk in life with everything, every flight we take, every car ride we take. So if you overwhelm yourself with risk, you will overwhelm yourself with fear and you'll be able to do nothing. So it's a balance. It's a, it's a dynamic balance which exists. Uh, we have somebody asking, uh, they're curious about the name Spenomanic. Uh, can, you, can you explain it a bit, how you, how you came across the name and developed it? Is it connected to Spenta? No, it is not. It is not. Most people think it is connected to Spenta. It was not. It was a question of chance. And, uh, so, and these, these, these queer or strange chances, they, they do happen. So the company that eventually took over from Thermax as an agency at that time was called Spencon. And they wanted to get in the equipment business. So a name Spen plus Matic was put up and the Spenomatic was formed. And then that name, that brand became pretty big, went on. So all I did was move it from as one company to make it as group. And that's how the name has come. But I'll tell you an interesting anecdote. In our, in our uh, flower companies, in the horticultural companies, our company's name is Expressions Flora. And we used to sell our flowers in the, in the Dutch auctions by the name of X Flora. And one day, I just Googled Explora saying, you know, it was under the brand Explora. So I just Googled it for, for a lark and I found 2000 pages on it. So I said, how can there be 2000 pages? We've just hardly started this business. How can there be 2000 pages on Explora? And then I found Explora actually meant space blooms. They are, they are stars in the in space that form that form structures which which look like flowers and they are called space blooms and they are called explora and yeah. we were called explora so <laughs> some some of these All things, these amazing just, things. Yeah. yes 
Yeah. I'd like to ask one question. Now. Okay, Adel has a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> Which is you talked about faith. Some may call it providence, others might call it luck. You also talked about networking, interdependence, taking care of stakeholders, win-win, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. So my question is, are you not putting all the ingredients to work towards making your own luck, your own faith? maybe maybe so what do we do we learn we learn from our environment we learn from our families we learn so this is what i learned this is what i learned from my parents this is what i learned from my immediate family this is what i learned from my environment which is what i learned from my company where i worked and uh, i decided not to i decided to discard the things negative thoughts negative ways I decided to discard them and not go ahead with them and decided to go with the positive thing. It was a matter of choice. And uh, when all of them got put together, the results were phenomenal. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, I have a question. Uh, my question is, uh, Mr. Surti, you've been in a wide variety of different uh, different locations, you know, starting out in Calcutta, going to Jamshedpur, uh, so forth in India. I think you said Pune. Pune. Uh, yeah, and then and then Nairobi, and as well, you've mentioned you've traveled all over the world. What I'm wondering about is, as a business person, how do you reflect on the differing legal and political structures in these environments and what do you see as hopeful and and uh, promising in in the various uh, political regimes that you have confronted in life so i i i would say that the western world is far more structured the rule of law is is much more you have uh, you have a judiciary that is responsible as compared to not so developed economies however like india is developing many of these economies are also developing and slowly and steadily they are they are coming up to speed so in many things, I find the political structure, the executive, the administrative structure, the judicial structure is coming up to a, a high quality Western standard. For example, in Kenya, the Kenya Revenue Authority now, before it was all manual and semi uh, computerized. Now it is highly computerized. So they have used an Indian company, I think Infosys or Tata Consulting Services, whose software now runs the Kenya Revenue Authority. So automatically that has changed. Similarly, Western diplomats sit in these countries, you know, ambassadors of various countries, and they raise alarms when they feel things are not right. The UN sits in Kenya. It's the headquarters for Africa and for many other countries the whole of this you know, sub-Saharan region. So, so there is again interdependence there. The world, because of the internet, news, these international channels that are always available. So there is a movement, and uh, but there is no political interference or anything in your businesses here. At least in these parts of the world, it is, you, you do your work, you do your business, you keep you keep a straight line and uh, you let the authorities come and check you whenever they wish to audit you and if you are clear in your mind and heart and your business then politics doesn't bother you that's very good to know very good uh jehan your i think he's your nephew is that right he's my uh, yeah. son he has uh. um 
Oh, he wants you to reflect on the hardest or most difficult time in your business, the darkest time, and uh, how you prevailed, nonetheless, thanks to uh, Ahura Mazda. So uh, that is his, his inquiry. Uh, the hardest times, Jehan, were the early days when we were uh, much smaller as a company and Kenya did not have such good uh, financial systems. And unfortunately, Kenya had one rule that banks could not finance non-asset-based companies. So unless unless you were an asset-based company where you had a factory or you had land and you had property, they would not finance you. So there was no collateral to give. I had no collateral and I did not have a, any serious capital either. The only capital I had was intellectual capital and goodwill. So I was constantly taking customer money and rotating it in our businesses. So if that business cycle got broken, for whatever reason, not my fault, say a shipping line decided to delay the consignment and instead of coming directly from say Bombay to Nairobi, decided to go via Kuala Lumpur or, or Colombo or someplace and things got delayed, it would delay the business cycle and that would change the cash flows. And that used to really, really become the most challenging thing because the bank was not willing to fund you. Financial investors would, especially 20, 25 years back, were not willing to fund the way today. Today, every second day, we have some or the other financier coming to us and telling us, we would like to give you some fund and we are not interested. Okay, but at that time, those days were really, really tough. When you really needed the cash flow, bridge financing for a period of time, and that I feel was the toughest challenge that I faced. Managing the cash flow in the early days, especially when good others financing. were making it. Huh? Good financing is very valuable. Yes. So uh, we have a question from Mr. Rivetna, Roynton Rivetna, and he's asking, would you franchise some of your businesses? Would you ever do that? So there, there's, there's a lively question. Actually, I wouldn't franchise it, but we are right now in the process of expanding across Africa at a very fast pace. Uh, so we, we were operating mainly in Eastern and Southern Africa. We are moving into a lot of Western Africa, Northern Africa and other places. And the business prospects are so, so high and so good that uh, there are various models where I could work with local players there uh, who could value add. But franchise, I would not like to franchise. I would rather say we, we team up and work together with local players in other markets. So as of now, you would be in 12, 14 markets, but Africa is, is really, it's a very, very fast developing economy, the African yeah. economy. How did the pandemic uh, impact your your enterprises? <laughs> well, it was very tough. It was very tough, but I I I, I can say I'm I'm really happy about saying this that we we did not we did not dismiss a single employee. We did not. That was the first thing I had decided in my mind. I had a talk with everyone. I said nobody is going to lose his job. And we are all going to work together as hard as possible to come out of this. So second thing, we never cut anybody's salary. So uh, a lot of, a lot of in, people in the industrial circle who I know well, industrialists and others, said that this is a good opportunity to, you know, to give a salary haircut to people. But I was not for it. I said, these are my people. And I am because of them. So I'm not going to use this opportunity to cheat them. So I had a talk 
and actually spoke to most of the people personally, individually, over Zoom calls, over meetings, etc. And I said, look, we will not be able to pay salaries on time, but we will pay them and you have to trust me. But we all have to work extra hard because we have to come out of this. So though our engineering businesses didn't do well, but we were not, we were not, we were just about breaking even in the engineering businesses. But the solar business boomed in that period because the solar business, we created a narrative that, and especially because I had access to the whole of industry, there is hardly any company here that does not deal with us. So we are the leaders in the boiler field, etc. So I, I could actually, I started talking personally to owners of companies and telling them we have this solar product, we have financing for it. You're already struggling with your costs. We can help you bring down these costs by giving you a solar power plant so that your energy costs comes down and that will help you during this pandemic. So you, we leveraged on the pandemic to push our solar businesses to a different level. And so the highest amount of sales took place on the solar businesses that ensured that all the companies did well. In the rose farms, et cetera, initially there was a very big shock, but some things, you know, the quirks of life, how they work, the Europeans who buy most of our flowers, they, during pan the pandemic, they stayed at home. So during the low buying months, they were buying flowers heavily. So purchase took place. And uh, Valentine's Day, which is a very, the next year, you know, 2021, Valentine's Day, what happened was due to global warming, Ecuador and Colombia, who send a lot of roses to Europe, they missed the date, the, the flush. So the reds all came after Valentine's. So th the prices for our flowers went through the roof. So whatever losses were there in the early part got compensated in the later part. So somehow we managed to pull through. But eventually we were profitable on both sides, on the agribusinesses, on the engineering businesses, we were profitable. It sounds like you faced the adversity quotient and prevailed with, uh, yes. with considerable bravery there. Uh, we just have time for about one more question or so. Uh, one of the questions we have uh, in our chat is, have you ever used debt financing and how do you view that, that type of financing? Debt financing. We have used debt financing because as time went on, uh, we, we would get things like overdrafts, etc. And uh, we needed it. But I, the interest costs in these parts of the world are very, very high, very high. So, so the lesser financing that you use, the better is your profitability. You could really kill your company if you went for all kinds of financing, which in the Western world is not so. You Till recent times, you all used to get your money at LIBOR plus two, LIBOR plus three, or SOFR plus one. So Euro was Euribor plus one, Euribor plus two, but it's not the case here. Our financing costs are very high. So we, would have, we have used debt financing at times, but I am a little averse to taking funds unnecessary. I would rather self-generate our funds and then utilize them as much as possible because of the high cost of financing. Okay, we have a question in the chat from a Mr. Uh, Melwin Meta, but uh, Melwin, we're not quite sure how to how to hear you. Uh, can you hear me ahead. now? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Can you see me? Yes, we can yes. see you. Okay. Thank you very much, Vajit, for the ask, allowing me to ask the question, and thank you very much, Vajish. A very inspiring, very inspiring, really, very motivating as a newbie entrepreneur. I I really found that very very useful. I've got many questions, but I won't hijack the show. I just have one question about building a team and hiring people. How do you balance between keeping them happy uh, at the same time keeping 
keeping them motivated and uh, that they continuously perform thank you what's your first name melvin melvin mehta yes melvin should i tell you something please we are we are dealing with human beings we are not dealing with we are not dealing with robots who we input some code and then the robot will do something work with people as human beings who have feelings who have who are who are real people and who have real problems it's not only about giving a motivational speech when you deal with people you you talk to them as friends as your people who you want to empathize with and when they are able to talk to you and you are able to show them empathy for who they are what their problems are and you are able to connect with them then there is no need to motivate them etc i yeah. i don't think anybody in any of our companies says that they work in our company because of the salary i can assure you of that they like to work here because they feel happy here and that and a sense of belonging yeah that comes from you being a real person really understanding and talking to them genuinely so that genuineness comes across automatically you don't have to put up an act sure you don't have to take a from rule book number 3 let me apply it here no it's not necessary these sure. are human beings and empathy plays a very big role you you need to have enough empathy in you that this person and it can't be done on one day you meet them all the time you're talking to them all the time they have real problems sometimes you help them with uh, as i said the good deeds sometimes you help them with advice sometimes you help them with some financial help sometimes you give them there's a medical problem you say i'll refer you to this doctor just go here it could be anything sure but people feel for other people and that love is 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 a real feeling so even for the for their leader if they feel the love then there's nothing that you have to do special you just yourself got it got it thank you very much thank you very much uh just uh, one last question from mr bujwala is the increase in startups in india is it helping entrepreneurship uh what's it doing there how, how do you see that i think funds have come to india and so entrepreneurs are now finding it and they have round one funding round two funding but i i do think that after some time there have been so many failure startups because a lot of startups did not really want to build a business for perpetuity or for continuum like like the tatas again or any of these bigger conglomerates that you see they a lot of people have this mind that after i build it to this point i'll spin it off at a higher valuation and this valuation game is now initially it worked with the software companies but now i think it's it's become transparent that it's it's fake <clears throat> so there are real startups real entrepreneurs and there are some who are just using money for with a how do i put it with malefied intentions their intent is not right and okay. it it will, it will catch up with them yes yes very interesting uh just uh one last comment when you say rose farms we just all have wonderful pictures in our heads of roses uh how did you come across roses and start farms of them it just sounds so glorious and beautiful and magnificent uh tell me something about the aesthetics of of roses and how farming them just uh, contributes to that aesthetic and that's my my last question over there and i just want to say thank you very much and thank you also to adel and thank you to all of the people who have uh put in a lot of work to put this global webinar webinar together we have uh kashmira in london we have yasi tantra in mumbai uh so we have a globally dispersed team that's been able to do this and bring 
uh, a large audience to this presentation. Thank you very much for uh, gracing WZCC with this magnificent uh, uh, presentation and just tell us more about how beautiful roses are. Thank you very much, Vajis. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you wonderful. So, r roses, roses. I think I think this one is a tough one to answer. But uh, Adel is coming to Kenya uh, on the thirty first of August. Why don't you just join him? Maybe <laughs> you. It's a wonderful idea. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we have to have a, a tour over there. Yeah. Adel? Actually, I'm going to be there on August first, and I'm going to see the rose farm. August first. Yeah. You 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 should make a recording a video for us. For <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. We've had a, a wonderful afternoon with you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye everyone. Goodbye. Yeah. To any of the young entrepreneurs, any of the young entrepreneurs, to any of the young entrepreneurs who are already in entrepreneurship, my email address is there, my numbers are there. And if you feel you want to ask something you're always free to ask me. I would be happy to help. When is it that we're too old to be entrepreneurs? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Some of us are not exactly no, I, uh, young, I but I, we're I, trying. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean by age. I, I didn't mean by age. But Thank I'm you. saying who are in their early stages of entrepreneurship. In Nairobi is about six countries. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It'll thank you very end. much. Bye. You. Bye bye. Thank you. New I hope York you chapter. enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gorishma. Uh, thank you, Ada and uh, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Your chapter membership. We'll take your chance. Now, now the kids can make noise. Now the children might run around and make noise. Yes. Thank you, Ada. Okay, all I'm ending the Zoom session now. The hosts have left. Our speaker has left. Bye-bye. Thank you all. <laughs>